We start today in South Los Angeles, where there's been a deadly surge in gang violence over the past several weeks. Over the past two weeks, at least eight children have been among those shot in separate incidents. If you had a 27 separate shooting shootout in any other American city, it probably would have made 60 minutes. <laughs> but it didn't even make the news here. It's about controlling commerce. It's about controlling the flow of money in and out of community. And while some people may cast it as race, it's a form of manipulation that gang members use because they want to control an area, even at the expense of the lives of the people who live there. What do you wish this neighborhood were like? That there won't be no gangsters, no shooting around here. Anybody who walks into my office for the first time, a gang member who wants to work here, I always ask this one question. Name one good thing that's come into your life because of your volume. And I only get one answer. They always say, I can't think <coughs> of a single good thing that's come into my life. Now that's not the answer that they think I want to hear, that's the truth. But the other day, somebody gave me another answer. A homie sat there and he said, he thought for a long time and he says, well, my vadio has made me who I am. I said, no, it's kept you from who you are. A lot of times people think kids are joining a gang because they're seeking something, but they're always fleeing something, always. No exceptions, I never met an exception. The outsider view often drives the inside of this, our policy and how we see things. So people stand outside this issue and they go, there's gotta be something positive that kids are drawn and attracted to but there is no lure, there is no attraction, there is no draw, there is no pull factor, there's only push factor. Kids are not seeking anything positive. They're fleeing something horrendous when they join a gang, that's why. Oh, well, I arrived at Dolores Mission Parish in the mid 80s, uh, and it was the poorest parish in the city and the largest grouping of public housing west of the Mississippi. And, but it also happened to be, which I didn't know, but it, it was the place of the highest concentration of gang activity in the whole city was my parish. So we had eight gangs at war with each other in this tiny little area. So this began really because I was burying kids. So I buried my first in 1988 and my 180th uh, just before this past Christmas. 88 to 98 was just the worst reaching a thousand gang-related homicides in 1992 in L.A. County, which is, it's, it's never been like that before. So we started to do things. We started a school, a jobs program. Um, then we couldn't find enough felony-friendly employers, so we started our, a business, and then another business. And then, and here we are, this is our fourth location. You know, 1,100 gangs, 86,000 gang members, so about 15,000 folks walk through our doors a year, and then uh, you name just about anything that might be of help, and we do it.
But I met Nancy at a, uh, I think it was a fundraiser that somebody had in, uh, in their home and she was invited and we got talking and the next thing, you know, she wanted to volunteer and this is what she did and it's been hugely successful. And she's speaking, she's speaking there'll be a cityscape here, but she's speaking this truth, right? And then in the center, there's this, there's this, um, I'd known about Homeboy for a long time um, and I'd sort of been circling around it, it's always been of interest to me. And independently, in my own sort of studio practice, I had developed a series that I called Bullet Blossoms. And it was really, it sort of addressed issues around violence and, and healing and sort of those two things coexisting. I went and saw Father Greg speak and talked to him afterwards and sort of said, I have his, my studio practice. And so I came up with this idea for a collaborative, collaborative project. And he really want, but he said, I really do want you to focus on the kind of hopeful piece of this, which is where, which is what the blossoms are about, which is, you know, hope coming out of despair and hope coexisting with despair and, and moving. And that's why we ended up calling it Exit Wounds, because it's really about what we leave behind. I had this preconceived notion of what it would look like and you know I just had this idea like oh this is how it's gonna go and this is how it's gonna look and the, the obvious lesson is you have no idea how things are gonna go. Even just putting them together was such a gratifying experience. You know, how do we tell the story effectively through composition? So I mean there were sort of sort of formal art things that we were working with, but really focused mostly on storytelling. And then uh, I asked them where they would want the bullet holes and they told me where they want them, how many, how many of they wanted, and then we would talk about what color blossoms, and that was all sort of a part of, you know, how will this balance, and what does this mean, what does this signify? I knew I wanted to do art early on, but in the street life, you don't really do art. All you could really do is like tag up or represent a hood. So I, what I would represent, I would tag up on walls, and I thought that was art. I didn't think I could actually be classified as an artist, you know. So I thought Nancy was going to teach me how to be an artist. So I came into the class and then she said, it's collage work and then you do it and the whole process. So I liked it and I just stayed with it. And now I'm an artist, <laughs> it's cool. That night was amazing because walking in there and just watching the homies and homegirls stand next to their artwork and, and everything got snatched up. I, she knows this better than I do, but it was, they were all sold like instantly. And just the pride of, of you know, I did that. It makes me feel like I could do more. It means, first, I'm proud, I'm happy, I'm grateful. My works is out there and people could see it and they could, they see what I was, what I, what I was thinking at the time I made it. But now I feel like it, coming from the street life and the drugs and the gang, and it sees I don't have to live that way. I could actually go the opposite way and be productive and make something like, I do art and I could, I could make money off it and I, not just make money, just be happy off it. So. It's really something that we're, we're using to celebrate all of the talent and, and individual voices that we have here to talk to the community, to engage with the community and have that be, you know, a part, just another extension of what Homeboy gives. I think in the old days I was, we were more in, I was a dispatcher, you know, gang member meets job, go, next. This is a group uh, that's in need of so much healing that we kind of lost sight of that. So I used to say a job does 80% of what needs to get done. It gives a gang member a reason to get up in the morning and a reason not to gang bang the night before. But I, we were missing that 20%. We've now found what that is now, which is a therapeutic community, a place of healing, a place where you can be held, a place of attachment repair, a place to find and discover resilience so that you can leave here and the world will throw at you what it will and it, and it won't topple you. Community trumps gang. Everyone please bow their head. Of course. Um, I like to pray for everyone here at Homeboys, all their visitors. 
coming by to visit us. And for everyone to have a good day and make right choices when you leave early today. Amen. <laughs>